So tonight I want to talk about tinsmiths and travelers, but actually I really talk tinkers, tinsmiths and travelers. Next slide, Roland. Roland, Sorry. next. It, yeah, no, it's, it's coming. Okay. Yeah. I want to call it tinkers, tinsmiths and travelers, but unfortunately the word tinker today has rather derogatory and pejorative connotations. It's no longer considered a polite word to use. And I, you know, I, mean, I would respect that, but I, at the same time, tinker has a very specific historical meaning, which I will be dealing with. So I will be using tinker, the word, but specifically in a historic setting, and certainly not as a pejorative and derogatory term. So travelers is a much wider term that covers a whole number of things, as we'll see. But I put this poem in Robert Burns' Jolly Beggars. My bonny lass, I work in brass. A tinkler is my station. A tinkler is a Scottish version of tinker. This man was clearly quite happy to tell the world he was a tinker or a tinkler. So clearly in, when this was written in 17 something, being a tinker or tinkler was certainly not considered a base occupation. So that's what I've been trying to talk about tonight is the importance that uh, tinkers, tinsmiths and other travelers had in our history generally. This picture on the left uh, of Willie McPhee, the last of the tinsmiths, it's a cover of a book, a very good book. He certainly was the last of tinsmiths, but he carried on the business of working with tin plate right into the post-war period. Next, Roland. And the next one again, thank you. Right, if Willie McPhee was the last of the tinsmiths, who was the first of the tinsmiths? This flat bronze axe, found at a metal detecting find from Tarradale, uh, was certainly made by some sort of smith, a metal smith. And you can see it has been coated with tin. That's slightly unusual um, for that to, to happen. This is a rare type of axe. And when this would have been first cast, and we don't know how they managed to get the tin coating on it, it would have been a splendid item, you know, shining bright like polished silver. This was never meant for chopping down trees. This was um, a ritual <laughs> object, an object that was buried close to Tarradale chambered cairn. Next, Roland. Yeah, it's coming. Now, who are these people that made these axes? Well, this is a sort of drawing of some Bronze Age um, metalsmiths. Now, bronze is uh, an alloy of copper and tin, and the advantage of making bronze over pure copper, though pure copper does occur naturally, it's a very soft metal and it's no good for tools, but it's also a difficult metal to smelt if you need to cast it. But if you mix copper and tin, you have two advantages. Firstly, it m melts slightly lower melting point, and also the end product is stronger. Next. And this is the kind of thing, of course, we always assume that these uh, Bronze Age um, metalsmiths were making these wonderful axes. Next. And though bronze casting is not easy if you've never done it before, um, the fact that, you know, this chap on the left, this is Susan Cruz's project in the Black Isle um, showground here, casting um, bronze items in memory of North Kersic, where they found molds for bronze things. It's, it can be done reasonably simply if you know what to do. But certainly in the past, these bronze smiths would have been magicians, full of magic and mystery. Because essentially they take pieces of rock, copper and tin ore, and produce metal tools out of it. Next. I'm just going to jump about 1500 years from the Bronze Age to the early historic period. This map here is prepared by Andy Heald, but with some additions by me. Andy Heald did his PhD thesis on non-ferrous metalworking based on the evidence of moulds and crucibles found at certain sites in Scotland. And his map shows two things. The red dots, which I've emphasized them in red, um, are the basically hill forts. And these seem to be the centers of um, bronze working at this early historic period. And the precious metals, not only bronze. The big red dot is Rhiney. Now, Rhiney hadn't been excavated when Andy um, did his PhD thesis, but there have been more molds found from Rhiney, that's the ones in the top left, more molds from Rhiney than the rest of Scotland put together. So we know we can get, um, we find these uh, molds on historic or rather important sites, and we've got Craig Fabric in Inverness, Rhiney, 
Dundun, um, Alt Clut, uh, Dunard, Dunoli, Clutches Craig, Moat of Mark. These are certainly important central places. But the black dots out further afield is also where they found crucibles and moulds. And Andy Hill's thesis is that metalworking was carried on there by metalsmiths coming from the elite centres. There were travellers being sent out by the, whoever was in charge to these uh, dependent areas, reinforcing the connection, reinforcing the power of the elite over these more local people by saying, look, look what we can do for you if you stick by us, if you, you know, be good boys. So that's his thesis. I think it, it probably does, does, does work uh, uh, as an idea. Next. But what do we call these people? This is the big problem. I've been calling them metalsmiths and various things. There are a number of words because we are into the early historic period. We're just beginning to get into periods where we have written evidence. And the word cared, which is a Scots form of cared, and the plural of which is cared, and my Gaelic is not good, um, is usually today translated as a tinker or a traveler. But the old word cared, the first line of the text here, was an artificer or craftsman in metal, the same word in Scotland and Irish Gaelic. And there was an even older Irish word, was referred to an artificer artist, composer, and poet, a much wider word. A macker, to use a very good Scots word, a macker. Today a poet is a macker. So it was originally a wider, a wider word. And you know, were these people, these travelling metalsmiths, were they bringing more than just metal? Were they bringing, you know, stories, um, you know, oral traditions and so forth? But the word tinker, how do we get from care to tinker in Scotland? Well, once upon a time, people thought tinker had to do with tin, but it isn't, as though it looks as if it should do. And there's been a very good paper that Rona, in fact, drew my attention to, saying that the first word is tinne, a Gaelic word which means a mass of metal from a smelting furnace, a pig or an ingot of gold or silver. And so a tinne caird can be construed to be a skilled artificer using smelted metal. And that's the word we think was then Scottish tinker or tinkler. So it is just a, a Scots attempt to render a very meaningful phrase in Gaelic. And we know that between 1165 and 1214, James Tinkler held land in Perth. He was clearly an important person to be able to hold land at that time. Next. This is what these people were making, these wonderful splendid brooches. And unfortunately, the half of the right-hand one is obscured by uh, some of the camera views here. But the one on the left is a Tara brooch from Ireland. The one on the right is a Hunterston brooch from Ayrshire. So they're all from the same um, Irish, Scottish area, um, Gaelic-speaking area, Dalriata and so forth at the beginning, well, during this early historic period. Cast in, in gold and then finely worked. And if you look at the Hunterston brooch on the right, this beautiful wirework Celtic decoration. I mean, to me, it is just magnificent. And I mean, these brooches have been described as some of the finest craft work in the world at that time. Next. But if the Cairds were making these brooches, which some people suggest they were, because if they weren't making them, who else was making them? Well, they're making everything else. This is the St. Ninian's Isle treasure. Um, a number of penannular brooches, as you can see. These are mainly cast silver rather than gold, but clearly very Celtic in the decoration. But also uh, a number of silver bowls. Now, the silver bowls, you start off with a, a cast sheet of silver, then you um, beat it into shape around a former, and you end up with a shaped bowl. Now, the, the top bowl, the one with a very shiny uh, face to it, you can see the been decorated, very simply decorated with just a punch, making circles and the circles intersect. And you get a lovely pattern, um, a four petaled flower here, but the picture just below is slightly corroded. You have to look carefully. You'll notice in fact that there are six lobes there. It's a six patterned daisy whale or a hex foil. Now, of course, we've had correspondence in, in Gnosis about these uh, daisy whales. Roland uh, very kindly reintroduced us to them. This is a theme that I will repeat throughout this talk. Next. 
this is a thousand years later, this is a tin mold for, well, the sieve actually for drying cheese. But you can see, made by travelers, but you can see how, again, the daisy wheel is used on there. So it's a very persistent symbol. I think it means something. Okay, next. Yeah, sorry. Um. Okay. So we move into the medieval period, and though the really fantastic quality of the Tara and Hunterson brooches is not quite being maintained, there still is a high level of precious metal work being made by these uh, traveling craftsmen. The one on the left, the Loch Bui brooch, consists of a central crystal, it's rock crystal, which has been encased in a cage of metal, of silver, and it says underneath, and this is a label attached to this object, the silver ore, and I think they're O-R-E, metal ore, the silver ore of this brooch was found in the estate of Loch Bui in Mull and made by a tinker on that estate about the year 1500 and was handed down by the ladies of that family. That's the Maclean's of Loch Bui. This was clearly a very important brooch, family heirloom, but also they were very happy to say it was made by a tinker. So I think you're getting the message here that in this formative period, Tinkers, if we use that historic word, were very important skilled craftsmen who had an important position in society. The jewel on the right, the Glenorchic charmstone, is not quite so well made, but it's the same thing. We have a piece of rock crystal surrounded by a silver frame with a suspension over hanging around your neck. And these crystals were seen as, were seen as very magical things, warding off evil. And even the, the charm stones, apparently, if you dip them in water, the water took on the, the capacity of the stone. You were one ahead of me, Roland, but it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Um, do you want me to go back? No, no, I'll be okay. So the point is, no, we're quite happy with that. The point, the next point I want to make, so we've got these charms encased in metal, but I think the charms had also something to do with with cairns, craftsmen, tinkers, because they often had, you know, these magical qualities. And do remember that gypsies have crystal balls. Are we seeing some ancient connection here? Again, that's just an open question. If we move from the medieval to the post-medieval, late medieval, post-medieval people period, we can see that still uh, metalwork continues, but not quite in the same level of accomplishment. These two bigger ones are plaid or plaid brooches that you wore on your shoulder to keep your plaid in place. The one on the left has just the last stuttering of Celtic interlace and knotwork. The one on the right is just sort of more random decoration, a wee bit of knotwork in it. So these are large ones for plaid. The two below are more for putting at your shirt collar. The one on the left, no decoration. The one on the right has little sort of patterns around it. The one on the right is a metal, sorry, was a field walking find from Taradale. So we found our own uh, Cairns brooch. Next. Sorry, Roland, you're doing two jobs at yeah, once. Okay, so this picture here, one of my favorite pictures, this is the hen wife at Castle Grant. I can't claim to have ever had any direct connection with Castle Grant, but this is the hen wife picture up here. Picture painted in early 18th century by Richard Watts. And he painted several other, um, including the Piper of Castle Grant. But this lady is wearing brooch near her neck. It's not gold, it's brass, but it's one of these, just as I described. But she's also holding a horn, a snuff horn in her hand. This is a container for snuff. Um, just a horn, cow's horn, softened and flattened. That would have almost certainly been made by travelers as well. So this lady is wearing two items that would have been made by these traveling craftsmen. And that horn would have been carried in the, her belt, in her belt bander. Next, Roland. If we continue this uh, metalworking tradition by traveling craftsmen, these brooches are usually referred to as um, Luckenbooth brooches. The three on the left are, well, they're all fairly simple. They're not, again, high quality work. But the, the yellow one below is, is brass, it's not gold. But these were made by travelers just out of a piece of silver. In fact, you could even adapt part of a spoon or even hammer a coin flat, a silver coin flat to make these. And these were often bought by uh, lovers to give to their sweetheart as a sign of betrothal. The one on the right, the big, the big sort of shiny one, and the spoon to its right, was made by Charles Jimison, 
uh, a silversmith in Inverness about 1800. Now he became a well accomplished Jim, uh, silversmith with his own marks and all the rest. Of it. But he had started off as a traveling silversmith and became settled in the town. And this again is a theme. A lot of this craft work that we're seeing becoming of lesser quality in the travelers, the good quality of stuff is probably moving into towns with the growth of towns and the trade guilds, the Hammermen's uh, Guild and so forth and corporation. Then a lot of the scale was in towns rather than still out in the countryside with traveling craftsmen. Next. I have not mentioned iron at all so far, but we do need to do it. Though the story is complicated and this bit of my talk is far from well worked out. Iron is a very different metal to bronze and other metals. It's, um, it doesn't survive very well because it rusts, hence these rather poor looking tools. But also it's much more difficult to work. To smelt iron, to make out molten iron, you have got to have 1500 degrees in your furnace. That's not easy in the past. You need a, a proper powered blast furnace to do that today. But you are able to kind of get it almost there. Next, Roland. So this furnace on the left, this chimney looking affair, is a simple furnace, a bloomery furnace. Now this is part of an experiment done with Gordon Noble at Rhiney. And uh, these chaps here, a particular guy on the right, he was a, well, a good metalsmith. And they, into the, the chimney, the furnace, you put um, ore and you put charcoal and you heat it up and you blow air into it. Traditionally with a bellows, I mean, these guys are cheating. They've got a, a portable um, compressor and a, and a um, hose pipe leading into the furnace. But normally you'd be operating a bellows by hand. And that's why it is difficult getting up to a very high temperature. Next, Roland. But if you get it to about 1300 degrees and tap your furnace, then the metal that comes out the slag has partly separated from the iron. The iron is still spongy, but if you take that out and hammer it like anything, the slag flies off in lots of scale and you have a, a bloom. And if you keep beating it and hammering it and working it, you get a chunk of wrought iron, which can then be reheated and used for different things. Next, Roland. Now, Gordon Noble at Rhiney was doing this um, furnace work because they found, of course, the Rhiney stone with the Rhiney man on it, and he's carrying an axe next. And here's one made to, to just copy that. Now, I don't know if they found metal sort of iron working evidence at Rhiney. They found little bits of iron. That pin I showed you along with the molds, in fact, is of iron. So iron is being worked as well, but I don't know if the iron workers were the same people as the cairns, the craftsmen who are making the bronze and precious metals. That's something I've not been able to, to work on yet. Next. But we do know where there was iron working. This is um, one of the caves at uh, near Rosemarkey. This is Lerne 2B. In the foreground, just where the um, ranging poles are, <clears throat> you can see a paler area. The dark bit behind was probably screened by a, by a screen. In this foreground area, just where the ranging poles, we found the remains of a furnace, and one of these bloomery furnaces, and next one. And this this is a piece of fired clay, but the hole through it is where the bellows was poked into the furnace. You poked, left a hole in the furnace, put the bellows nozzle, the tweer into it, and then packed it around with clay. And of course the clay cooks. We found that. So definite evidence of metalworking and Gemma Cruikshanks in National Museum in Edinburgh has looked at the, the material we found. So there was slag from casting, there was scale and hammer scale and all sorts of things showing that they were doing casting, bloom smithing and blacksmithing all in this little workshop. The date around 7 800 AD. But also, what the, the subsequent discovered just behind on the screen, uh, where these books and papers are lying. Next, Roland, they found, of course, the famous body of Rosemarkey Man, the skeleton of this man who had been brutally murdered. Now, the exact relationship between him and the workshop is not clear. They're both basal deposits, they both date from around well, 600, 700 AD, there may be a connection. I mean, this may be all part of this magic and mystery of metalworking. But I'll just leave it there. I won't go any further with that. Next. So were iron smelters more sedentary? Because you need heavier equipment. You need your furnace. You need big hammers and so forth. While a blacksmith, where you take your piece of worked iron and make it into something else, potentially more mobile. Next. 
So we do know that some travelers were blacksmiths. This is a, some gypsies. Um, and I've not used the word gypsy so far, but the gypsies are a very important part of the overall story. They started off in India a thousand years and more ago and started moving west through the Middle East and Turkey and into Eastern Europe. And this is a picture from Hungary where you can see that this lady is fiercely operating huge bellows blowing into a fire which you can hardly see but the gentleman on the right he's holding I'm pretty sure it looks like a horseshoe so they're heating up a horseshoe for shoeing so this type of blacksmithing work which can be done with with just using bellows to reheat the metal seems to be something that the gypsies and I'm using the word gypsy here gypsies certainly did next Roland and as they moved across Europe, then we find more evidence of this. The picture on the left is by the Dutch artist Valmans. In the bottom right, you'll see two men over a fire. They're heating a horseshoe. Um, so Robbie's going to shoe one of these horses. The horses are in a cave, as you can see. And again, that may be significant. The man with his hand forward is having his fortune told by the, uh, the gypsy blacksmith's wife. So this again is all just reinforcing this role of gypsy travelers in ironworking. Next. But we also know that ironworking was moving into towns. Um, see, part of this picture is obscured for me, but I hope you, some of you can see that there's a blacksmith there in a workshop hammering away at a bit of metal. And this is um, a lot of ironworking was done in urban workshops, but still some we don't know how many out in the countryside and certainly blacksmithing was done in Scotland before the gypsies arrived in Scotland. Gypsies came to Scotland in 1500. So we have to find out which group, was it the cares or was it an alternative group that did the iron working. Next. But if we move into the post medieval period, as I said, the more valuable side of craft metalwork was disappearing, um, moving into towns and it was more ordinary work was being done. Now we can use the word tinsmithing here because this chap is working tin plate. Tin plate is just a thin sheet of iron encased in two sheets of tin and the tin of course protects the iron and prevents it from rusting. But tin plate can be worked cold. He's hammering away on his little anvil, his spike, making what almost looks like a mug. He's putting a handle onto some sort of tin can. So tin smithing, using the word properly, meaning a man who's working in tin, but tin smithing or white smithing, slightly wider form, includes copper and brass. Next. And here's a more modern one, making a bucket with copper and just beside him there is a, a brass coal hod. Next. And this is the kind of things that these uh, traditional Scottish traveling tinsmiths made. Here we've got a whole range of um, tin goods, um, jugs are holding water, milk, or even paraffin later on, uh, various other containers, holders of candles, the lantern, the Pierce lantern there was a classic one, and again another one, Roland, and candle molds for making tallow candles. So this is a type of stuff. Now most of these things, except the candle molds, they are mine, but the other bits are all in the, Nash, in the Highland Folk Museum, where you can see plenty of examples of this work. Next. And the tin ware was then uh, sold or bartered by these traveling families and round these tinsmith families, round the houses. And this wonderful picture of this lady with her tin plate buckets and basins and bowls hanging around her shoulder. She's also got a baby on her shoulder as well as a barefooted young girl with her. This of course is all part of the, the patter to impress upon the people that look, I've got to look after these poor kids and okay, could I have some food and some clothes and a little bit of money and anything else. But the women were particularly good at this. Next. But this chap here is also could be called a tinsmith, except that he's uh, rather differently dressed. He's pushing a handcart. Now, technically, if you push a handcart, you're a hawker. You need a license. He's got his load of tin plate on it. Now, he may not have made that. And I think this is a stage further down. He's probably bought this from a wholesaler or an ironmonger, and he's hawking it around the streets. But he would have been a traveler. There's no doubt about that. I'm from a traveling family. Next. And... These um, tinsmiths also worked in pewter. Pewter is a soft metal, fairly easily worked. And there was a great period of pewter making that in some respects almost predates um, the, the splurge of tinsmithing. Next. 
and they made snuff boxes, one of my great uh, passions, um, pewter snuff boxes, and there's a brass one at the bottom there, and the one on the left has a, a cow's hoof as the container for the snuff and the pewter lid. So pewter snuff boxes, I think these simple ones were definitely made by travelers. Next, Roland. And they did other things. They would repair your copper kettle, the top right is a copper kettle, which has uh, got a lot of obvious solder on it, but it's been soldered together. But they would, sorry, Roland, sorry. back one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, they also repaired broken china and glass. So this dinner service, um, Mason's Patent Ironware, Ironstone, has been repaired by some travelers with a whole number of um, copper rivets. And they were particularly good at that. So if you broke a plate or a dish, on the right is this a glass cover of a cheese board, um, which has got a big crack around it, and that's been fixed with these rivets. So you kept things for the tinker. You kept your repairs waiting for the traveling tinsmith. Sorry, you said tinker, traveling tinsmith to come round and repair them. Next. But horn working was also a function of the travelers. Now, I don't know how far back this goes, but they, they were certainly well associated with horn. You could obtain horn from farmers as you traveled around and you could swap a bit of tin for some horn. You had to get the bone, the, the core out of it, split it open, and then if you flattened it next, Roland, and put it in a press, you got these horn spoons, very common. I would say that pretty well every one of these was made by a traveler. And big milk skimmers on the left and more eating spoons on the, on the right. Next. And they also made horn cups where you just uh, keep the shape of the horn, put a, a bottom on it. Some can be very basic and crude. Um, some are a bit more decorated and the little one on the right has got silver mounts, possibly within the scale of a traveler. But we know the travelers did take horn to jewelers. And some of these jewelers may well have, as I said, have been travelers originally anyway. And uh, so the mounts in this one may have been put on by a jeweler and sold by a jeweler. More as a, a souvenir rather than a utilitarian item. Next. But they also made powder horns. And David Caldwell, um, some of you know him, has written a very good paper on these powder horns. And again, it's just a flattened horn, but usually decorated. In the bottom left of the picture, you see just the most basic ribbon interlace you can think of. The one in the top left has got scrimshaw type um, marks on it. The bottom right has got sort of Baroque sea swells, but the top right has got some daisy wheels on it. So again, we're finding these daisy wheels and I just would love to get to the bottom of that. Next. And they also made other horn, when we saw pewter snuff boxes, but uh, horn snuff mulls. The one in the top right with its brass mounts, again, well within the capacity of a travel, traveling tinsmith. Next. The even bottom left, this one just come up, which has got silver mounts, fairly sil simple silver work. And I think that could have be easily been made um, by a traveler. But the next one, Roland, is a bit more ornate. It's got a repoussé work and a jewel. That would have been made by the jeweler. But the horn, the, the original horn, which has been tidied up and heated and this end curled, they curled the ends of snuff mulls so they could fit in your pocket. Remember the hen wife of Castle Grant, her mull was just the, a horn was just as from the cow and flattened. And she would have kept it in the belt. But once people wore pockets, you had to get your snuff mull to fit your pocket. So this bottom right was one started by a traveler and finished by a jeweler. Next. Now horn working, I said, I don't know how far back it goes, but it's certainly at least to 1792. Now this chap, William Marshall, was a very famous person from the borders. He was a tinker, says here, probably closely connected with gypsies because he was considered the gypsy king. He probably wasn't 120 when he died, but he was old. But he was a horn worker. The back of his gravestone shows these horns and horn spoons very carefully. So again, I don't know if it's an ancient craft done by um, these traveling craftsmen from day one, or whether it's something they took to when the bottom fell out of the, the precious metal market, as it were, for them. Next. And basket making is another um, activity. Um, again, I don't know if they've always been basket making. I mean, basket making is relatively easy. Most people in the past may have made their own baskets, but we do know that travelers did make baskets. Next, Roland. 
And here's a picture, a post-war picture of a basket seller. I'm not saying he necessarily made them, but he said he was selling them um, to the tourists at Lagan. Um, he's got his transit van in the background. He's got his tent and he's got his uh, trailer. Um, and he's all set up to sell these baskets to the tourists. So basket making did continue. And in fact, I think it was um, either Willie McPhee or Williamson, another famous traveler, who said that you could always sell baskets. You couldn't always sell tin plate, but baskets seem to be always popular. Next. And woodworking. So we'll have to do this briefly. But I was very surprised to learn that these are made by travelers because I've been collecting these all my life. These are classic pieces of Scottish woodwork, treen. The mainly very simply made um, with alternate staves of wood. So it's stave work. So you just cut different color woods and stick them side by side. And the, the one in the middle is a salt bucket. The one in the bottom left is a sort of luggy for drinking milk or possibly even whiskey out of. And it's again just these staves, but they're feathered together. You can see some feathering there and bound round with these withies. The top right one is a quech, definitely for drinking whiskey, which again is made from staves, is the top view. And if you have the next picture, and what is uh, in the middle of it? A daisy wheel. Next, Roland. And again, this is just to reinforce the beauty of these um, traditional Scottish bickers and luggies made with staved work feathered together. So again, simple materials, but incredibly effective. And to me, very, very beautiful things. Next. We're coming to the end. So getting back to metalworking, because all this horn working, basket making, woodworking, I don't know if that was an aside or whether they were always doing that. I haven't sorted that bit out. But metalworking did continue getting less and less significant in some areas. The top left chap is shoeing a horse, I think, at Appleby Horse Fair. The man on the right on his bicycle here is sharpening knives and scissors. I mean, he's not even supplying the metalwork. You're supplying the metalwork. He's just sharpening for it. And I can actually rem remember uh, a knife grinder like this in Aberdeen. Though luckily, he did get a little van with his grindstone in the back of it. The chap in the bottom left is separating metal for scrap. And this, in some respects, was the last gasp of metalworking, was recovering metal for scrap. I mean, a very important industry. And many travelers made a lot of money out of it and became you know settled scrap merchants and even you know used car salesmen next but if we continue the story of the basis of the traveling economy changing through time it gets more and more difficult to be a traveler if you want and i've not looked at all the social aspects and all the way that people look down on travelers or tinkers as they as they call them that's another story but this picture here of these rather well-dressed people they are from a traveling family or they were the lady in the middle looks like a duchess with a fancy hat her father's death certificate traveling tinker her grandfather on her mother's side was also a traveling tinker her husband was a huckster which is a sort of horse dealer and she and her husband, in one of the censuses, 1881, I think, are described as hawkers. She was hawking clothes and he was hawking furniture. But in the next census, she's described as a lace agent. She's changing the name. Her, the boy at the back, her son, he became a commercial photographer. Well, a photographer had a studio, in fact, in, the, in Aberdeen. But he also still did a bit of traveling. He went out and took photographs of people on farms. So, we, and this, the lady in the middle, she ended up as a boarding house keeper in Aberdeen. Why am I showing you this picture? Well, the lady with the hat is my great grandmother. The man behind him is my grandfather. Thank you very much. Next, Roland.